Russia's invasion of Ukraine began as a story of military aggression. A larger power invades a smaller one. But it's quickly turned to these allegations of atrocities and war crimes as Vladimir Putin's soldiers have launched these gruesome attacks on civilians, on children, tying up bodies found in mass graves, reports of blatant menacing attacks that target the innocent, including of soldiers raping women in Ukraine. Some world leaders are reassessing their views of Putin, who's largely operated as a controversial but largely accepted member of the international community. He generally gets the top meetings he needs with world leaders. He weighs in on global policy through the powerful U.N. Security Council. Putin has even seen his popularity rise on the American right, praised by Donald Trump and other Republicans. So as Putin is now dubbed a war criminal and seen as the ruthless dictator that he is, it's important to note very little is new about his current actions, which brings us to our special report for you right now on how Putin built power, initially as a bureaucrat installed to then win an election and then as a dictator who crushed any and all opposition to prevent free or fair elections during his ongoing reign. Indeed, it was 20 years ago when Kremlin insiders installed Putin as a replacement to Yeltsin, and then Putin was deemed the winner of an election after running as that installed quasi-incumbent. In Moscow, preliminary results of the presidential elections have been announced. According to the data from the Central Election Commission, Vladimir Putin has been elected president of Russia. Elected president of Russia. And that history matters because it's truly more than history right now. It is a power structure he built, which enables him to lead these atrocities in plain sight, to lead a war that is increasingly controversial inside Russia, which matters if there's going to be opposition that might change the course of this war or save lives. Now, Putin's crackdown on most opposition inside Russia is, to be clear, bad for the Russian people. They are effectively oppressed. It's also very bad for the Ukrainian people because it complicates any potential payoff for even an effective Ukrainian resistance to these Russian incursions right now. Because if there aren't many levers that impact Putin at home, then it's harder to make even an effective resistance stop the next attacks. Now, since the war began, Putin's forces have actually gone further than before. They've been detaining over 15,000 anti-war protesters. Putin pushed new, harsher laws that shuttered the few independent press outlets that even remained in Russia. And by pledging to jail reporters, domestic or foreign, who report on the facts that the Kremlin deems wrong, well, he has further suppressed even international reporters who might otherwise be in Russia. Russian citizens can face jail for using words like attack, invasion, or war to describe this war in Ukraine. And that is a sign that Putin knows a long war will not be a popular idea at home for him. Kremlin state media, they refer to it as a special operation, something that sounds contained or perhaps powerful. When Russians see even more rules banning opposition or protest, or even specific words they might use, let's be clear, better than anyone else abroad, Russians know how serious the consequences are because when Putin's regime kills opponents, they often do it quite blatantly and publicly and brutally to send a message that even a few words by a person, I mean, words out of their mouth or in writing, uttered in or even outside of Russia can be punished by execution, be it shooting or poisoning. Putin's hit list is long. Journalists and activists and critics of Vladimir Putin who have mysteriously been shot to death or in surprisingly large numbers, poisoned to death. A Russian who was a critic of uh, Vladimir Putin found dead in his home in London. The Russian spy Alexander Litvinenko, who drank tea in London laced with polonium. Alexei Navalny is the latest enemy of Vladimir Putin to fall victim to possible poisoning. Gunned down on a street in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev. The murder of a man deeply critical of the Russian government. Putin's attacks and alleged killings of dissidents can be traced back to as early as 2002, when an opposition member of parliament was shot under very mysterious circumstances. Eight months later, another opposition lawmaker who had spoken out about the murder of that colleague as, quote, politically motivated, was then shot dead on the streets of Moscow. Same year, another former lawmaker who was an investigative journalist for a reform-minded newspaper died mysteriously while investigating whether an apartment bombing was linked to Putin's government. Russia classified his medical records, adding intrigue 
about whether the Kremlin killed him. Russian reporter Anna Polovskaya documented government abuse and police state tactics in her book, Putin's Russia. She was shot in 2006 at point-blank range in an elevator. It was the second attempt on her life. She survived an earlier attempted poisoning. She wasn't known for any other lethal enemies who would go this far. Under public press pressure, Putin went out of his way to deny involvement. Anna Politkovskaya, a Russian journalist who exposed killings, torture, and other abuses against civilians in Chechnya, was gunned down in an apparent contract killing. She was a correspondent for Novaya Gazeta newspaper and was an outspoken critic of the Kremlin. She'd made many enemies, most of all those in the Russian army and paramilitaries. That was in the 2000s, and it was not considered big news everywhere. We pulled some of those clips from places that were, to their credit, paying attention. It's some of the evidence that critics cite for how Putin controls information about him. There's also a series of suspicious deaths and killings of people in the government arena, from candidates who might oppose his power if a fair election were held, to veterans of the Kremlin who turn against Putin or call out what Russia has become. Take Alexander Litvinenko a former KGB agent like Putin who had unusual access to the government's inner workings. He accused Russia's security services of organizing the coup that effectively gave Putin his power. And while he had to flee to the West, it did not save him. He died in London after drinking that cup of tea mentioned earlier, which was laced with radioactive poison. When Mr. Litvinenko was poisoned by the radioactive substance polonium-210. His murder was an operation of the Russian security service. And the inquiry goes on to say the killing was probably approved by President Putin. The suspicious killing, also an example of how many Western countries often have to just sidestep Putin's crackdowns, even when they occur inside these other nations. This poisoning was on British soil. It was found to be carried out by two Russian agents on orders probably approved by Putin, according to a probe that used strong circumstantial evidence. The men were charged, but Putin simply defied requests for extradition and then celebrated those who were accused of doing this brutal killing. Putin gave one a medal for, quote, services to the motherland. Now, before Putin invaded Ukraine, it was also the site of executions carried out in Russia's interests. A former Russian parliament member who'd criticized Putin was shot in the back in broad daylight in Ukraine's capital. This was in 2017. Now, Russians know the risk of speaking out against Putin, so it's all the more striking that many continue to do so. Even powerful, connected government veterans, though, can meet the same fate. Take a former deputy prime minister who was very well known in Russia. Almost, you could think of it like a role of, say, a former vice president in the U.S., it's a powerful person. Everybody knows who they are. And yet this one, Boris Nemtsov, had initially backed Putin and then staked out an opposition leadership role that might have really challenged Putin. Again, he had a following. He had credibility. It was someone Russians knew who had been open to Putin and then was hitting him for what he'd done to Russia. Here he was in 2011. <laughs> People are tired of Putin. When he announced he would run for president in September, in order to rule for another 12 years, people realized that he wants to remain in power for life. Putin rigged the election. According to estimates, he manipulated 13 million ballots for his party of crooks and thieves. They are against the reign of cynicism and lies, against a lifetime of Putin in charge. Straightforward set of accusations, backed by evidence. And Nepsov proved he had people behind him because there were big street rallies. He was tapping into an opposition that's relevant today because he also protested against Putin's increasing incursions into Ukraine, arguing that wasn't helping the Russian people. He was out in public, blocks away from the Kremlin, when a seemingly skilled unknown assailant came up from behind him and shot him four times in the back. Putin denying wrongdoing in that case as well, but journalists found Kremlin security had already been tailing Nepsov for 10 months. Now, he may have hoped that his prominence enabled a kind of a platform to get heard and perhaps stay alive in contrast to far less connected Russians. But he also knew the risks. He outlined them to American journalist Anthony Bourdain. What you're about to hear was just one year before that execution in the streets of Moscow. Critics of the government, critics of Putin, bad things seem to happen to them. Yes, unfortunately, existing power 
represent, let us say, Russia of 19th century, not of 21st. If you have good relationship with Putin and his uh, people around, you have a chance to raise money, to be successful. But if something happened between you and Putin and you and governor, you will be in jail. <laughs> it's very easy. In any government, the power over policing is always susceptible to abuse. In Russia, Putin uses the police to destroy his opponents quite regularly. One KGB veteran said Putin's government is using the special service to just liquidate its enemies. And when Putin can swiftly disappear people, he does. Now, some have survived attacks, bringing notoriety that could raise the cost of trying to kill them again. Some Russia experts say that is what may be keeping Alexei Navalny alive right now. He's probably the most prominent opposition leader to Putin today. He's showed courage in taking him on and building a constituency. For example, six million people follow his political messages that he shares on YouTube. Millions more appear to back him in Russia. He's held big rallies. He formally ran for president in a system where elections are supposed to be set in advance by Putin. And he has combined domestic credibility with growing international interest, making his case against Putin in Russian and English. These are people who are trying to steal my country, and I'm strongly disagree with it. I'm not going to be, uh, you know, a kind of speechless person right now. I'm not going to keep silent. That's a message across Russia and throughout the world, and Vladimir Putin is clearly afraid of Navalny's reach. He wouldn't even say the man's name, which seems like a weak and fearful tack to avoid promoting him. But Navalny's would-be killers put his name back in the news when they attacked and poisoned him. He was medically evacuated out of Russia in that instance, hospitalized in serious condition for a month. A probe, again finding evidence that Putin's agents were likely responsible. Navalny was clear on what he knew and what he thought about who was behind that failed assassination. Navalny told the German newspaper Der Spiegel that Russian President Vladimir Putin is responsible for the attack that left him in an induced coma fighting for his life. It's maybe it's the most toxic uh, agents invented by the uh, humans. Now, Navalny could have tried to stay abroad after recuperating from that attack, but he didn't. Knowing what he knew, and a lot more than what we know here, but just think about what we've just seen he still returned to Russia to challenge Putin, where he was jailed. The Kremlin claims he's corrupt and a, quote, terrorist. He's been held in prison since then, and recently the government added nine more years to his prison sentence. The outcome shows how Putin mixes murder with a kind of improvisation. He'll kill you when he can. If Navalny had stayed abroad or quieted down, well, he might have kept his freedom. But when he returned, Putin adjusted the plan to imprison him potentially forever, avoiding the creation of one more famous martyr, perhaps. And he was just seen within the last month looking quite gaunt in a courtroom. You see here, human rights experts say the whole case is a sham, another political crackdown and abuse of the government. Now, there are other cases that follow the pattern where poison is, is used to remove opposition, even if it does not kill. Putin has long tried to control Ukraine. And when a candidate there was deemed too critical of Putin in that country's 2004 election, he was poisoned and left here, badly disfigured afterward. Russia denied any involvement at, that, at the time then. Journalists, opposition figures, government veterans, and even candidates in other elections in other countries have seen this fate. That's the type of target that Putin has went after and killed for years. And many have tried to treat him as a, a kind of a world leader who could be reasoned with amidst all this. Some have suggested he's a smart and great leader, as Donald Trump's Republican Party had spent years claiming, although that looks pretty tough to square with the history you just saw over the last few weeks in Ukraine. The record also shows what Putin really is. Contrary to Trump's claims, Putin is the opposite of a great leader. He's a murderer. He uses brute force to bend even very powerful people to accept him, even abroad. And he's clearly intimidated many powerful people. Now, in rare cases when people who are far more powerful than activists or writers stepped up to Putin, when someone with more resources said they were going to draw a line, what did Putin do? Well, this is also telling and important as the world considers this challenge right now. 
We know billionaires are quite powerful everywhere. But especially in Russia, where a network of government-connected billionaires, or oligarch, a term that's been batted around for years, those billionaires act like kind of a shadow cabinet. And the one-time leader of that group, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, was an oil tycoon and the richest man in Russia. This was back earlier, when Putin was consolidating power in 2003, and that billionaire decided if anyone was going to draw a line in public, he was the one to do it, and he could do it. And at a meeting with Putin, he criticized government corruption and other issues to Putin's face. The image you see there is striking. Kordakovsky reasoned that he was basically above reproach. He was not a writer or a journalist or an activist who might just be disappeared. He had oil wells. He had planes. He had lawyers. He had high-level links to this government. Putin reasoned otherwise. The Kremlin orchestrated the swiftest government takedown of a billionaire in the history of the world, collapsing the man's company, seizing and freezing all his assets, arresting him on supposed fraud charges and throwing him into court, you see there. Kordoskowski was literally whisked from his own plane into prison. He was tried in a glass cage in court in public for all Russians to see. That's the cage there. Now think about this. Putin did not proactively plan the billionaire's show of defiance. He didn't know that was coming. But when it happened, he used it as a strategic dictator to send a message that he hadn't been able to send before in that way, that no amount of money or connections can save you if you cross him. Faced with lemons, Putin made a kind of dictator's lemonade. And then regular Russians could see then, and this was in the earlier phase, before some of the poisonings I just showed you, they could see if this is what happens to the Elon Musk of Russia, the Jeff Bezos of Moscow. Imagine what would happen to you if you went anywhere near any of this kind of talk. Kordakovsky served 10 years in prison. He was ultimately able to be exiled after a lot of international pressure. And we've covered this story before. In fact, years ago, he joined me for a rare TV interview on the beat discussing the risks he faced in jail after that Putin sentencing, as well as Putin's view of life. Could I have been murdered? Certainly. I was knifed in the face while sleeping. This is a man with a very particular view of life, a view typical of special services operatives or gangsters. If you show willingness to negotiate, it means you're weak and must be squashed. Kordakovsky faced that gangster rule and now lives life in exile. Others continue against all odds as an opposition leader, Vladimir Karamurza, who survived two poisoning attempts that he says were ordered by Putin. To its credit, the U.S. Congress invited him to testify about Putin, using that power and prestige of a committee hearing and putting it on the public record, where he was able to issue some warnings that have only grown more dire over time. This was six years ago. After taking over or shutting down independent television networks in the early years of Mr. Putin's rule, the Kremlin now controls all the national airwaves which it uses to rail against the outside world, as well as Mr. Putin's political opponents at home, who are denounced as traitors, foreign agents, and enemies of Russia. Those who oppose Vladimir Putin's regime risk not only their well-being and their freedom, they also risk their lives. This brutal authoritarian blueprint has been out there for years. Abroad, some can look away. At home, Russians know the score. The news tonight... The man you just heard there, Mr. Karamurza, was arrested today in Moscow. Charges still unknown. It's the same day that he decried Putin's war in Ukraine and the team behind him as a regime of murderers in a newly released video. There is a terrible symmetry to all of this because the worse that Putin's forces perform in this war, the more urgent his crackdowns become because his grip on power is based on certain lies. To keep power... He must always prevent the truth about his government from getting out. And yet these people continue to speak the truth at great cost. There's no quick or easy solutions here. But the truth is clearly vital. It may be what still scares this powerful, lethal leader the most. Think about that. Vladimir Putin has nukes and guns and an army, and he is scared of the truth, scared of these brave people you've seen. The truth is what he takes the greatest effort and risks to contain. And the truth is Putin is a murderous dictator who kills opponents and launches wars. 
Now what has been documented and known for so long may finally be taken more seriously because of this terrible war, because of the more strict international scrutiny. And perhaps that will just be a start to a world that faces this dictator down better and stronger. And that world leaders might summon perhaps a fraction of the courage that so many less powerful, more vulnerable Russians and critics have already shown.